It is not a sin to be gay. That's not what the Bible says. I believe in the Bible, and the Bible is against homosexuality. Well, the Bible mentions homosexuality negatively in certain contexts, but it also mentions heterosexuality as negative in certain contexts. We can talk about that, but let's get something straight first. The Bible does not talk about the experience that gay people report. Most gay people experience same-sex attraction as something that's innate and unchangeable, an unchangeable part of their reality, something natural, something that they were born with. Well, just because someone has a genetic disposition towards something doesn't mean they should act on it. It's been shown that there are people who are genetically predispositioned to abuse alcohol or other substances, and they have to resist those urges. So it's the same way with same-sex attraction. That is something that even if you're predisposed to it, it is something you have to resist. There's a difference between alcohol abuse and sexual homosexuality. It's obvious that alcohol abuse can destroy people's lives. The result of alcohol abuse is never positive. So that's something that we can easily say should be avoided even if you have a disposition toward it. But with homosexuality, we can't show that it is harmful in all cases. Certainly there are harmful expressions of homosexuality if one is being promiscuous, but homosexuality in and of itself does not carry harmful consequences the way that something like substance abuse does. Well, it's harmful because it's against God's natural order. God made male and female. Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 19, from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. So Jesus clearly taught that God's intention was for one man and one woman in marriage. And furthermore, God's intention is clear because a homosexual relationships cannot bear children. Only male and female relationships a heterosexual marriage can bear children. Yes, I agree that God's original intention was for male and female for marriage and for populating the earth. But a lot of things have changed since God's original creation. Some of those changes are bad, some are good, and some are morally neutral. For example, God didn't create people with blue eyes. Blue eyes didn't come about until there was a genetic mutation that caused blue eyes. Now, even though God didn't, the, uh, blue eyes weren't part of God's original creation, a lot of people think that blue eyes are a beautiful addition to the world. So, in the same way, although God originally created male and female to be attracted to each other, that's not always true now. And couldn't it be that just like blue eyes, gay people are a beautiful addition to the world? Yes, gay people are beautiful people who are created in God's image and God loves them. All people are created in God's image and God loves us all, but he doesn't want us to act on all of our sexual desires. So all Christians are called to live holy lives, and we all have to say no to ungodly lusts of the flesh. God does not approve of homosexuality, so that lust of the flesh needs to be submitted to God, just as anyone else's lust for sex outside of marriage or uh, multiple partners should also be submitted to God. I agree that Christians should not just give themselves over to lust and live in the lust of the flesh, but many gay people are not doing that. Many gay people are living chaste and holy lives, and they desire the same things for their relationship that heterosexual godly people desire in marriage. 
they desire sexual intimacy in the context of marriage and family. And so isn't it possible that since many people experience same-sex attraction as an innate and unchangeable quality, that maybe God is happy for them to be married to someone that they're attracted to? Well, there are some people who have changed their attractions. What about Rosaria Butterfield? She was a lesbian professor, LGBTQ activist, and then she got saved. And she gave up being a lesbian when she got saved. Now she has, uh, she's been married to a man for over 20 years and she has children, and Rosaria says she no longer has same-sex attraction. I love Rosaria Butterfield's testimony. Her journey to find the Lord was really amazing, and it's inspiring, it's encouraging. I love her passion for Christ and her commitment to Him. But her experience is not everyone's experience. I believe her testimony, but that doesn't mean that she's correct about all of her conclusions. She has a beautiful family, but there are beautiful gay marriages and families too. What? How can you say that? You're endorsing a sinful lifestyle. The Bible is clear. Leviticus 20.13 says, if a man has sexual relations with a man, as one does with a woman, both of them have done what is detestable. They are to be put to death. Their blood will be on their own heads. See, it is detestable for a man to sleep with another man. That is from the laws of Moses that were given to the Israelites. The Bible is not a book that you can just open up to any page, read the instructions, and be doing what God wants you to do. You know, the laws that were given to the Israelites were God's covenant with them. Those laws do not apply to us as Christians. We have a new covenant with God, and those laws aren't part of them. Yes, you're right, those laws aren't for us, but the morality expressed in those laws is for us. And those laws say that having sex with a man is detestable. And it's so serious, it was punishable by death. Do you know what else it says was detestable? Eating pork and shrimp. And you know what else was punishable by death? doing any work on the Sabbath. Hey, didn't I see you at the mall last Saturday shopping and eating a piece of pepperoni pizza? Yes, but those laws were not moral laws. Jesus said that it's not what comes in from the outside that makes you unclean, but the things that are immoral that come out from the outside. Jesus declared all foods clean. Jesus said, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So that's why it's not immoral for me to shop on Saturday and love my pepperoni pizza. So you're admitting that what God said was detestable for the Israelites is not detestable for you. Well, some things have changed, but not homosexuality. The New Testament is clear that homosexuality is a sin. It is wrong. 1 Timothy 1.10 says that practicing homosexuality is wrong. 1 Corinthians 6.9 says that homosexuals will not enter the kingdom of God. This is a matter of life and death. Yes, I think that you're right that this is a matter of life and death, but maybe not in the way that you're thinking. You know, many gay people have felt so rejected and so ostracized by the church and their family and even believed that God had rejected them. And for some, this has caused so much despair that it led them to commit suicide. So since this is so serious, we should be sure that we are understanding those verses properly. Now, the word used in both of those passages is arsenikoitai. And the problem with that word is that it is completely unknown 
in Greek literature of that time period. These are the only two references to that word in this uh, time period. There are a few later references, but they are also in lists of vices. And when you have a list of vices, it's very difficult to tell what the actual meaning of the word is because there's no surrounding context to help you understand what's being talked about. So homosexuals is not a good translation here. In fact, it's a devastatingly bad translation. If you trace the history of the translations back, you'll find that earlier translations, English translations, did not translate arsenokoitai as homosexuals, and for a good reason, because whatever is being referred to in this passage is not, certainly not, a broad reference to gay people. And so, what does this word possibly mean? Well, the word arsenokoitai is made up of two words, uh, which mean man and bed. So it, it probably is fair to assume that it involves sexuality of some type, but what's important is that it's certainly not referring to homosexual monogamous relationships. There were some really disgusting sexual practices happening in Roman culture. One of them was pederasty. So this was older men who were married, usually, and they had sexual encounters with young boys. They would be in a, a relationship where they were teaching the young boy, but they were also using them for sexual favors. And so that was broadly practiced in Roman culture. And so, you know, homosexuality was, in Roman culture, was almost always bonus sex in addition to one's marriage partner. Now, the most well-known passage in the Bible that describes this is Romans 1, 26 and 27, which says, Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Notice this says, their women. So these people are married and they're looking for other ways to satisfy their sexual desires. They aren't satisfied with loving, committed, marital intimacy, but are going after things that are more titillating. But the, this says these are unnatural sexual relations. They are shameful. Homosexuality is unnatural. Well, is men having long hair unnatural? Is it disgraceful? Because those same words that are used here in Romans are also used for describing men's hair length in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It says, doesn't even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a disgrace to him? Hmm? How does nature teach us that? Actually, what I learned from nature is that if a man just keeps letting his hair grow, it's going to grow as long as a woman. So that seems like what's natural. How is that unnatural? Well, the issue is that the way that we use this word natural and unnatural in English is different than the way Paul was using it in his context. So we think of natural as something that's not tampered with by humans, that doesn't require human intervention. And something unnatural is something artificial that's maybe, you know, we make in a laboratory or something like that. Well, n natural meant something different in Paul's context. What it really meant was like according to social norms. Natural really meant according to the social norm. So uh, when Paul is talking about the homosexuality that is unnatural in Romans chapter 1, he is talking about homosexuality that goes against the norm for righteous and holy living, something outside of marital context, something that and, and, and if you read the entire passage, you'll see that the homosexuality that occurs 
is by people who have denied God, given themselves over to idolatry, and become increasingly lustful in their pursuits. So, well, you're comparing homosexuality and long hair, but we have examples of men with long hair in the Bible, so we know that's not wrong in every context. But we don't have anything positive about homosexuality in the Bible. Well, you're right, we don't. We don't have any positive examples of homosexuality in the Bible. We don't have any examples of um, a homosexual marriage. But there are lots of situations that are not covered in the Bible. And so in those situations, we have to apply biblical principles in our context. Now, when I'm advocating for same-sex marriage in the church, I'm not advocating for homosexual practice as described in Romans chapter 1, where people are abandoning God, worshiping idols, giving themselves over in an excess of lust to all kinds of sexual practices, which would be even unnatural for them if they're heterosexual and they're married and they're still so lustful that they're looking for other ways to satisfy their sexual desires. That is against social norms. That is not uh, what is right and holy for godly living. So I'm advocating for same-sex marriage, which is based on the biblical principles of loving one another, being committed, being faithful, and and living in a relationship that is self-giving. You know, homosexual marriage has the same potential for uh, self-giving that a heterosexual marriage does. You know, is this really even all about just sexuality? Because all of us, if we make a marriage commitment to someone, we could say our vows and then the next day our partner, our spouse could get in a terrible accident and never be able to have sex with us again. So we've we are com but we'd still be committed to that person to love them to cherish them to care for them and so that is what christian marriage is that's the foundation of it i have a lot of compassion for gay people i really do it must be so hard but since god created male and female and a marriage is between a man and a woman and jesus affirmed that we cannot go against Jesus' teaching. Self-sacrifice is part of being a follower of Christ. I know sexual intimacy is hard to give up, but people can do it. Paul did it. Jesus never had a sexual encounter with anyone. Look at Beckett Cook. He was a man who was living a gay lifestyle and then he got saved and his life changed and he knew at that moment that he was no longer going to uh, be living a gay lifestyle he was he knew that homosexual relationships were sinful so he gave it up now he still has same-sex attraction but he knows it's more important to follow christ and his love for christ is and has changed his desire for his life, even though that attraction to men is still there. Yes, I absolutely love Beckett Cook's testimony. His The story of his salvation is so inspiring, and I'm so glad he's my brother in the Lord. I love his passion for the Lord and his willingness to give up everything that Christ asks him to give up. We should all be willing to do that. All Christians should be willing to give up things that the Lord asks us to give up. But is the Lord asking gay people to live out lives that are completely celibate? Well, I don't think God is demanding that gay people be celibate, but I do think the options before us are celibacy or a marriage with someone of the opposite sex. Uh, the marriage imagery 
was so important. God made them male and female, and that uh, the marriage is even a picture of what God's plan is for humanity. It was, you know, Jesus calls himself the bridegroom, and the church is his bride. Yes, but Jesus' bride includes both male and females, doesn't it? So is Jesus going against the created order by marrying himself to men? You're taking the imagery too far. <laughs> the marriage of Christ and the church does not involve sexual intimacy. The marriage imagery is showing what God's relationship will be with his people, a loving, faithful, intimate relationship with his people forever. It's not about sex. So you're telling me that sex isn't Christ's goal in marrying the church? That Christ marrying the church is about an intimate, loving relationship that lasts forever? Well, is it possible that what God is looking for in marriage between humans is an intimate, loving relationship that lasts forever? And maybe he isn't as concerned about the biological correspondence of male and female as some Christians have presumed. But you're talking about changing something that has been solidly attested to in Christian tradition for 2,000 years. Are you saying that all the church fathers and Christians throughout the ages were wrong? No, I'm saying that when the church was first established, there was no such thing as gay marriage. It did not exist in that cultural context. So now we need to consider and respond to our cultural context and what God might want from our morality in this context. Cultures change, but God's morality doesn't change. God's goodness doesn't change, but his expectations for human behavior does change. And what is moral is sometimes heavily influenced by our cultural context. Mm -hmm. For example, it was moral in 1 Corinthians when Paul talked about women wearing head coverings because that was appropriate for the cultural context. We are commanded five times in scripture to greet one another with a holy kiss. But that is not something that most Christians today would consider a moral command. Instead, we might shake a hand or just say hello. Now, in the New Testament commands the churches to take up collections for widows. Well, there was a huge problem with widows in that cultural context. There are different social nets and things in place that make uh, and there's also less widows in general in our cultural most of our cultural contexts so this uh, moral provision no longer applies now the the old testament calls charging interest on a loan detestable it was completely forbidden and it was even forbidden in the church for 1500 years it was forbidden to take loans with interest. Now that was a provision to make sure that the poor were not being exploited. But now taking a loan with interest is not really controversial among Christians. So it isn't that the church was wrong for 1500 years and now we're getting it right on these matters. No, it's that moral principles express themselves differently in different cultural contexts. It seems to me that there are gay people who desire the love and intimacy that's found in marriage and that maybe God isn't as concerned about keeping to the original design of male and female as some Christians assume that he is. God's original design didn't include blue eyes, but no one is calling me immoral for having blue eyes. A lot of people think Blue eyes are a beautiful addition to the world. I think God delights in blue eyes, gay people, and in loving, faithful, same-sex marriages. Please reconsider your position, Shauna McDowell. 
it's something to think about. If you're a gay person who has been rejected or ostracized by the church, please do not take that church's rejection of you as a sign that God has rejected you. God has not rejected you. God loves you just as you are. And there are many churches that will welcome you with open arms and tell you how much God loves you just as you are, that Jesus Christ is your savior. He died for you. He loves you and you are welcome in his kingdom. If you're looking for more information on this topic, I've put a list of resources in the description. One of the best resources is the Reformation Project. This is a group of Christians who are fighting for LGBTQ inclusion in the church, and they have a lot of great resources. So I recommend checking those out. God bless you, and thanks for watching. His own self for him.